But in the first instance, the return of the feeling heart into itself is to be taken to mean that it has an actual existence as an individual. It is the pure heart which for us or in itself has found itself and is inwardly satiated. For although for itself and its feeling the essential being is separated from it, yet this feeling is in itself a feeling of self. It has felt the object of its pure feeling and this object is itself. Thus it comes forward here as self-feeling or as an actual consciousness existing on its own account. In this return into self there comes into view its second relationship, that of desire and work in which consciousness finds confirmation of that inner certainty of itself which we know it has attained by overcoming and enjoying the existence alien to it, that is, existence in the form of independent things. But the unhappy consciousness merely that finds itself desiring and working. It is not aware that to find itself active in this way implies that it is in fact certain of itself and that its feeling of the alien existence is this self-feeling. Since it is not explicitly aware of this certainty, its inner life really remains a still incomplete self-certainty. That confirmation which it would receive through work and enjoyment is therefore equally incomplete. In other words, it must, set itself, it must itself set at naught this confirmation so that it may indeed find it in it confirmation, but only confirmation of what it is for itself, that is, of its dividedness. We just witnessed in the previous paragraph this, this interplay of what Hegel has called the infinite or the pure heart. And it's an attempt to bring together the two sides of consciousness that lead it to be the unhappy consciousness. So this, un, this, this heart is really an expression of the unhappy consciousness. Here in, in paragraph 218, Hegel is going to say, okay, well, we, we saw that there's an impasse there. Can we move in a different direction from this? Now, this theme is going to show up in later parts of the phenomenology, so we don't want to forget about it and say, oh, we're going to leave it behind at this point. But he, he's going to give us a little bit of uh, review. He says, in the first instance, the return of the feeling heart into itself, right? So why does it return into itself? He tells us a little bit uh, more there. Um, it, it was not able to attain to the unchangeable universal. In the mode of thought, it was able to do so in a kind of grasping way that had to do with, with feeling, right? But feeling is mutable. Feeling is not really the thing by which we're going to grasp the unchangeable, for Hegel at least, because feeling is feeling. Feeling is, is so shifting. So he says, the, the, the feeling heart returns into itself. It's kicked back, you might say. And that process of being kicked back is actually going to be productive for it. So this is one of those uh, lessons that it's learning where it doesn't like it at the time, but it's actually benefiting from it. He says, um, it, it's taken to mean it has an actual existence as an individual. So the person becomes conscious of their individuality. And we're going to see this theme running throughout, oh, about the next four or five paragraphs in particular. So he says, it's the pure heart which for us, for us, or in itself, has found itself and is inwardly satiated. Now, if it stays satiated, it's not going to progress any further, right? Uh, that's not going to be an issue, as we're going to see. And he says, for although it, for itself, in its feeling, the essential being is separated from it, right? The essential being being the unchangeable universal. Yet this feeling is, in itself, a feeling of self. Now, what does he mean there? There is feeling going on in two different ways. There's feeling as sort of attending out towards the, the infinite, the unchangeable universal. It realizes itself as infinite, though, in that feeling. So there's, there's a double feeling going on in feeling. Pretty typical Hegel, right? Nothing is ever completely simple. There's always a duality uh, implied and then exposed in it. So he says... It has felt the object of its pure feeling, and this object is itself. So what, what do we have here? It's so close to realizing that this unchangeable universal that it, it's trying to grasp is actually its own consciousness, which somehow is still united with this other part of itself that it feels to really be itself. 
but it doesn't quite get it. So we're going to see a transition to come, uh, in, in this he says, it comes forward as self-feeling or as an actual consciousness existing on its own account. In this return into self, there comes into view its second relationship, right? So this is the first relationship. This is right here, the second relationship. The modes of desire and work. And Hegel is going to talk both in sort of the, the abstract or substantive of uh, desire and, and work. And he's also going to talk specifically about the person, the individual, desiring and working or, or laboring. Now, why turn this way? Is there some sort of internal necessity to the, this whole process? Well, Hegel mentioned that already uh, when he set out this schema for us in the earlier paragraph, so we don't have to rehearse that. This is the, the second moment, the second relationship. What is going to come out of it? Perhaps that displays the necessity. It's not going to in this paragraph, but it will in the, the following paragraphs as it unfolds. He says, um, Consciousness finds confirmation of the inner certainty of itself, which we know it has attained, by overcoming and enjoying the existence alien to it. What is that? Existence in the form of independent things. Desires and work, as we saw in the master-slave dialectic, and as we also saw in the earlier uh, shapes of consciousness in this section, Desire and work allow the person to nullify the independent things, nullifying them as independent, making them dependent. There's a dialectic here, of course, because in order to work on them, you have to adapt yourself to them to a certain extent. Uh, one way you can do that is by putting somebody else to work. You know, the Stoic gets beyond master and slave. We've, we've seen all that, right? What Hegel wants to say here, though, is that this way, so when, when this happens, this gives a kind of self-certainty, or let's, let's call it instead a self-confirmation. I assert myself over the object, over the independent thing that I work upon, that I desire, and that I therefore then enjoy. Right? I crack the nuts open and I eat them up. And the nuts aren't eating me, I'm eating the nuts. It's not like, you know, uh, Yakov Smirnov and in Soviet Russia the nuts eat you, or the can of uh, soda eats you, or drinks you, or any of those sorts of things. The swimming pool uh, cleans you instead of you swimming, cleaning the swimming pool and then swimming in it. Right? Uh, so what happens here works for the realm of objects. Does it work for what consciousness is attempting to do here? Well, what is consciousness attempting to do? It's attempting to grasp the unchangeable universal. It keeps on skirting itself away from it. Is this going to work? Hegel says no, not at this point. He says, um, the unhappy consciousness merely finds itself desiring and working. It doesn't find itself attaining to the satisfaction that it wants. It is not aware that to find itself active in this way implies that it is, in fact, certain of itself. See, with the, the enjoyment, you can say, aha, I know, I'm in charge here, right? You don't have that enjoyment happening here. You just have desiring and working, and it doesn't seem to have a terminus. So there isn't that sense of, of confirmation, at least not explicitly for, for the individual here. He says, um, it's not aware that to find itself active in this way implies that it is in fact certain of itself. Its feeling of the alien existence is this self-feeling. So what is this, this alien existence? It's really the self, the self that is desiring and working aiming at some object beyond the desire and the work, not realizing that that is itself. It's not going to realize that for, for quite a while yet, right? So he says, because it's not explicitly aware of this, its inner life still remains an incomplete self-certainty. The confirmation that it would have, an enjoyment, 
is therefore incomplete. So it must set at naught this confirmation so that it may indeed find it in confirmation, but only confirmation of what it is for itself, that is, of its dividedness. So instead of having a confirmation that unites all of this, again, the division is being placed here between the active individual being and whatever this is that it's after that we've been calling the unchangeable. The world of actuality to which desire and work are directed is no longer for this consciousness something intrinsically null, something merely to be set aside and consumed, but something like that consciousness itself, an actuality broken in two, which is only from one aspect intrinsically null, but from another aspect is also a sanctified world. It is the form of the unchangeable, for this has retained individuality. And because, as the unchangeable, it is a universal, its individuality has, in general, the significance of all actuality. In paragraph 219, Hegel is going to introduce another wrinkle into what he's just developed in the previous paragraph, 218. And now we've got the individual who's desiring and working, maybe enjoying, maybe not, definitely desiring and, and working here. And Hegel talks about the world. Now, why does he do that? Well, you know, we saw that, that attempt to try to destroy the, the object and have self-certainty. We talked about that already. We saw that it's not able to do that with the, the other part of the unhappy consciousness, the part that's projected out. And now we're going to find out that this bifurcation is actually occurring within the world or the actuality, the Welt or the Wirklichkeit, right, in German, itself, the object for, for consciousness. So Hegel is going to tell us um, the world of actuality to which desire and work are directed now, because why? Because this is an actually existing individual who has to hold down a job so that he or she can actually eat and enjoy and acquire and do what they, they want to do. And they have desires. To be an existing individual means to actually have tangible, uh, although perhaps infinite as well, desires. So they are turned out towards the, the world, the world of objects, of seemingly independent things. And we saw that it's very easy to you know, undo, to, to destroy, literally, or to sublate, because the term that's actually used here is aufzuheben, right? Um, it's you know, it's that, that term that Hegel uses for making some sort of a supersession or sublation, however we want to translate it, transcending it. Um, that's what we do to, to the world of, of objects that we engage with. So he says that um, the world of, of actuality, the world of things, is no longer something intrinsically null. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's a side to the things that is intrinsically null, because that's why we're able to, to nullify them. That's why we're able to say no as we say, yes, I'm going to consume you, right? But the world reveals another side now. This is really interesting, isn't it? He says... Um, Something like that consciousness itself is what the world is, an actuality broken in two. So there is a brokenness on, on the part of consciousness. And there's also a break within the world. A break into what? Well, Hegel uses this term that, that um, Miller is translating as sanctified, geheiligte, you know, a, a holy world is a way that you could translate a very... Uh, close to the, the cognate. We might say sanctified, or we might say made sacred, right? This is the difference between the sacred and the profane. And why is part of the world, or a side of the world, then sanctified? This is where it gets really, really interesting. Hegel says that, um, here we go, it, it's a sanctified world. It is the form of the unchangeable. What does that mean? He plays this out. The unchangeable means being the universal, but the universal has already itself taken on individuality, individuality as a universal, or as he's calling it, individuality in general. 
Now, there's something that's being a little bit obscured by the translation here. When, when it's, we say the, that this sanctified world, this sanctified actuality, this dimension, is actually the form of the unchangeable, what Hegel is saying there is it's the gestalt. So this is itself, perhaps we could say, a shape of consciousness. But it's a shape of consciousness that is, to a certain extent, getting away from the individual when really all of this implicitly is consciousness. If consciousness were aware of being an independent consciousness and the world of actuality were for it an absolute nullity, then in work and enjoyment it would attain to a feeling of its independence, since the world of actuality would be nullified by itself. But, since this actuality is for consciousness the form of the unchangeable, it is unable of itself to nullify it. On the contrary, since it does succeed in setting it at naught and enjoying it, this comes about through the unchangeables itself, having surrendered its embodied form and having relinquished it for the enjoyment of consciousness. Consciousness, on its part, likewise makes its appearance as an actuality, but also is divided within itself, and in its work and enjoyment this dividedness displays itself as breaking it up into a relation to the world of actuality or a being which is for itself, and into a being that is in itself. That relation to actuality is the changing of it, or working on it, the being for self, which belongs to the individual consciousness as such. But in this relation, it is also in itself or has intrinsic being. This aspect belongs to the unchangeable beyond and consists of faculties and powers, a gift from an alien source, which the unchangeable makes over to consciousness to make use of. Now here in paragraph 220, we're going to see a really interesting transformation take place, a, an important step in the dialectic that you want to pay very close attention to, that the previous paragraphs have been getting us set up for. And remember, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the, the mode or the relation in which the unhappy consciousness as individuality is trying to grasp the, the essence, the, the importance, the unchangeable, whatever we want to call it, through the mode of desire and work. And what it's trying to grasp corresponds to the the unchangeable that is taken on individuality. So now all of this is going to come together. Let's see how that happens. So it says that um, consciousness itself is related to the world or to actuality, right? It says, if consciousness were aware of being an independent consciousness and the world of actuality were for it an absolute nullity, then in work and enjoyment it would attain to a feeling of its independence. We've already gone past that, right? Since this world of actuality would be nullified by itself, it would reveal itself as null. But we see now that the world or actuality, of course, has that, that aspect of the holy, the sanctified, the, the essential, what is really real. And why? Because it is the gestalt, it is the form of the unchangeable, resting beneath it. So he says, um, because this actuality is that, it is unable, that is consciousness, through its desire and work, is unable to nullify it. What's going to happen, though? It looks like consciousness has reached an impasse. It's digging in, and it just can't get any further. Why? Because it doesn't have the tools, or you know what it's working on is too hard. Well, now what it's working on, as an agency, is going to do something on its own part. What is it going to do? Is it going to simply change consciousness by itself? No. Is it going to disappear to, to nothing? It can't do that either. Is it going to just you know, wave a magic wand and make everything all right? No. What does it do instead? As Hegel says, and this is really uh, quite interesting, he says that consciousness does succeed in setting this at naught. Why? It's able to enjoy it. Why? Because the unchangeable, which you would think would mean it can never change at all, it can never undergo anything, it can never suffer anything, right? 
It surrenders, as Hegel says, its embodied gestalt, its embodied form, its embodied shape. To who? To the individual consciousness. What are we talking about here? We're talking about, remember, we have the, the essential, the universal, as itself an individual, now giving over its very individuality to the ordinary person who is consciousness for enjoyment. So that, that ordinary consciousness can grasp itself as being something that does matter, something that does have importance, something that is essential. This is really quite dramatic. You may not see this through all that metaphysical verbiage, but that's what he's talking about there. And so he says, consciousness on its part makes its appearance as an actuality, but it's going to be divided within itself. So we're still going to see this division. What is the division? It's into the for itself and the in itself, two aspects of consciousness here. And I have, I have to say, people have been asking questions about for itself and in itself on earlier videos when they show up. Hegel does not always mean exactly the same thing by them at every single stage in the dialectic. It's not like, say, Jean-Paul Sartre's being in nothingness, where these are fundamental categories of being. These are dynamic categories. So what is the for itself going to be here, he says? Um, it, it, it breaks itself up into a relation to the world of actuality or a being which is for itself, right? And how does that for itself manifest itself? Through here, in desire and work, right? This is how consciousness is for itself, through desiring and working, through, through changing things in the world of actuality, working upon it. Um, what is it going to be in itself? Well, this is where we get something still yet happening. Or perhaps it's the same movement. Maybe this is what surrendering its embodied state or its gestalt actually means. What is the in itself for the individual consciousness? It's what is coming from individuality in general, as we saw it called just a few paragraphs before and in the last paragraph. Now, how is Hegel going to phrase this, though? He says, um, in this relation, it also has in itself, it is also in itself, or has intrinsic being. This aspect belongs to the unchangeable beyond and consists of what? Faculties and powers. What does that mean? Well, when we think about what it means to think, there's individual thinking happening right now, for example, you're thinking about this, but what are you thinking with? You're thinking with thought by itself, or are you thinking with your intellect? Are you thinking with your power of reasoning? Are you thinking with your mind? I'm moving around from place to place. This is a faculty of locomotion, as you know, the ancients and, and the medievals would call it. These faculties and powers are general, and we're going to see an interesting interplay occur here now as we move into the next paragraphs. These are the in itself of the individual consciousness. How it uses those determinately is its for itself here. 